Set within the Carpathian mountain range on the winding border between Romania and Serbia, rests Europe's largest rock sculpture. Nestled amongst these jagged mountains and thick forests rising above the banks of the Danube River, there he surveys his kingdom, a representation of a man who lived almost 2,000 years ago, but still history remembers him. Decebalus was the last king of the Dacians, a people that inhabited what is predominantly modern-day Romania, but their kingdom would stretch well into Central Europe and down into the Balkans. He would hold the titles as the last king of Dacia, as he fought the Roman Empire against two distinct emperors in two historic wars for the independence and sovereignty of his people. He is still remembered alongside the other great Dacian king Berebista as a controversial emblem of Romania's fierce independence and identity. 2,000 years after this great king walked the earth, he now watches over his kingdom once again. Grand, resolute, immortalized, he scans the opposite bank of the Danube River into Serbia, his spirit mounted within his ever-watchful eyes, even now ensuring a perpetual protective gaze over his kingdom and his people. Hello and welcome to the Embers of the Past. It is my objective to shine some light on those peoples and cultures that walked the earth before us, and maybe the ones that we don't know as much about as they might deserve. Today we have the Dacians, and their last king Decebalus, not as famous as many of Rome's wars or great rivals, but this tale has all the makings to produce an incredible story. Gold, resources, ambushed legions, and the end of his civilization. I'm sorry ahead of time to any of my European friends for my horrible pronunciation, but please do subscribe to this channel if you're a fan of history, and let's get started with our journey. I would first like to give some insight into who the Dacians were, and give our story the appropriate canvas to paint upon. The Dacians were thought to be a subgroup of the Thracians, the result of Proto-Indo-Europeans mixing over time with early European farmers. Although theories vary in the vast field of anthropology, they may be descended from the Agathersi, a tribe of Scythian origin who migrated from the Pontic Steppe, above the Black Sea, in the 8th century BC. At the height of the Dacian Kingdom's power under King Burbista, the borders of his empire stretched into modern-day Moldova, Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland and Ukraine. The heart of the Dacian Kingdom, however, was set within the mountains of Transylvania. Their power stretched across the land south of the Danube, the Black Sea in the east, and the Tisa in the west, although at their height they would reach the Balkan mountain range in the south and into modern-day Czech Republic to the northwest. Under the great king Burbista, the Dacians had made huge gains and used their fortified positions within the mountains as strongholds to wage war from. They would attack or subjugate four of their largest neighbours during this period, and siege and occupy many of the Greek cities on the Black Sea. Burebista subjugated the Gatian tribes along the Lower Danube, next the long-standing Scordisci and then the Bastane people of Celtic origin who resided on the eastern side of the Carpathians. He would then head northwest and break part of the Boyan Celtic coalition in northern Transdanubia and western Slovakia that had been encroaching into his new kingdom. Burebista had waged war all the way to Bohemia. Still unsatisfied, he would turn his attention to Thrace, Rome, Macedonia and Illyria. This now united people was the dominant force in the region, and the Romans had become only too aware of it. During the Roman Civil War, both sides came to ask for aid from Burebista, his sword falling in favour of Pompey Magnus. While Pompey still held power, he would issue Burebista with the title King of Kings in the Hellenistic kingdoms of the Balkans and the Near East. Their alliance would not come to much though, with Caesar smashing the Pompeian force at the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC. Pompey would then disguise himself as a civilian and board a small boat to Egypt, where he would meet his ill fate on the order of Ptolemy XIII. Caesar had been aware of the threat posed by this growing Dacian power for some time. Their alliance with Pompey only strengthened his resolve that they would feel his wrath. Caesar would plan a large-scale invasion of the region and then onto Parthia to avenge Roman humiliation. The only thing that spared Burebista was Caesar's assassination, although in the end it was to matter not as Burebista was assassinated that same year after an internal dispute within his own tribes. Rome's interest in the region always continued though, not just because Dacia had access to the Black Sea ports and its inhabitants were a most unruly bunch, but also because of its resources. Rome had been suffering from economic difficulties due to uprisings across the empire. Alongside Nero lowering the gold content in Roman currency, rumours of mountains of Dacian gold had existed for centuries, and it wasn't just a myth. Dacia had active ancient mineral mines that had been in the region for thousands of years. They were rich in many resources which made them unique from other tribal groups, and their salt mines would supply trade routes well into Mesopotamia and beyond. 
Additionally, they were active miners and metal workers. From their copper and iron mines, they would produce vast numbers of weapons from which they would wage war. The Dacians were known for their love of surprise warfare, but also never feared a pitched battle. A large number of them would go into battle carrying a falx, a scythe-type weapon, a curved sword with a sharpened inner edge. They were known for being highly effective at slicing through the Romans' lorica segmentata and leaving gaping wounds, though they were most effective at targeting the head and limbs, easily taking off a legionary's right sword arm or exposed leg when in close combat. The Roman armour of the period even shows rare adaptations made to the armour and helmets. They made later additions of reinforced iron straps to protect the head and face from the curved blades. Additionally, they made adaptations of metal sheets, covering more of their arms and thicker padded vestments to be worn underneath. They also reportedly added a type of greaves or leg protection, which was very unusual and unique to the Dacian campaign. The Dacians would also go into battle and launch their ambushes alongside a draco, a large standard and wind instrument that had the form of a dragon with open jaws like a wolf. It was a hollow head mounted on a pole with a hollow tube fixed to the rear. When held in the wind or above the head of a horseman, it would fill with air and give the impression of life. It would also let out a screeching sound as the wind rushed through it. They were a tool of intimidation and tradition, but originally they are thought to have been designed to provide clear wind direction for Dacian archers. Since the death of Burabista almost 100 years earlier, the Dacians were no longer united, with no man strong enough to rule all the divided Dacian tribes. In the time between the great king Burabista and the rise of Decebalus, Rome had made incursions into Dacian lands and reportedly killed four of their five kings at a battle near the Danube led by Marcus Licinius Crassus. It was into this world that Decebalus was born. He was most likely a member of an important warrior family, being a high-ranking royal in line to succeed to a throne. It was in 85 AD that Decebalus made his first entry into the great pages of history. He would be responsible for leading raids into the Roman province of Mosia, located south of the Danube, on behalf of the Dacian king and suspected uncle of Decebalus, Durus. At this point the tribes would still not be united, but their raids into Mosia were a huge success. Decebalus would successfully raid the area, sacking towns of their wealth as he went and slaughtering the Roman garrison stationed there. In the end he would reach the Roman governor of the region and ex-consul Gaius Oppius Sabinus, whose head he would part company from its shoulders during the bloodbath. Decebalus was already starting to show a ferocity in battle that would stand out even amongst his time. The defeat at the hands of the Dacians was a worrying sign for Rome. They were already overstretched in Germania and needed to wrap up this Decebalus debacle as soon as possible. Little did they know he was just rising through the ranks, gaining recognition on the battlefield and showing the Dacian people why he was worthy of a crown. Domitian, the Roman Emperor, would arrive the next year with Prefect of the Praetorian Guards Cornelius Fuscus and a large force of well-trained soldiers. Together they reorganised the province and brought the entire Danubian frontier under centralised command. Domitian would then return to Rome after some successful raids into Dacian territories. After Domitian left, more raids and excursions would take place into Dacian lands. They were all suspiciously quiet, however. Cornelius Fuscus, Roman general and prefect of the Praetorian Guard, had served three emperors and lived under five. He had been involved in Vespasian's civil wars across all of Europe, was battle-hardened, experienced and was not in his position through any kind of nepotism, but through skill as a soldier. Domitian had returned to Rome and was parading through the city, celebrating his second triumph for this apparent victory in Dacia. Cornelius Fuscus, on the other hand, was still on the front line. He had now been reinforced by three additional legions and had a large force of five strong Roman legions and was ready to truly try and stamp out this ember still burning from the time of Burabista. Cornelius was well aware, if this ember caught a strong wind it would quickly become a flame. Cornelius' senses had been right though. The frontier had been suspiciously quiet. This would be because in their Dacian mountain fortresses and forested fort towns, a leading warrior of royal blood was quickly uniting the separated tribes. These divided people were not yet whole, but they soon would be. The winds had become noticeably louder. Cornelius would be marching through the heart of Dacian territory after crossing the Danube with two legions, having only had minor interactions with Dacian forces over the last months. A man of a certain level of skill in any craft can quickly sense when something is not right, even if it is not possible to verbalise such thoughts in coherence. Cornelius' experience had served him well. Unfortunately, he happened to be assigned this task in what is now Transylvania, a task that would end up making brave Cornelius just a page within a chapter of a great Dacian king's history. Cornelius' unease realised itself. 
His men would be ambushed and entrapped in a mountain pass. The Romans were surrounded on all sides. Cornelius would try to rally his men as they panicked at the huge Dacian force. Regardless of his efforts, they were massacred, except for a number of hostages taken for future bargaining and those few souls who were spared, left to stumble back to the Roman camp and tell the tales of the large-scale slaughter of their brethren. The Praetorian golden standards were taken, and the Romans had lost the fast battle of Tape, or the Iron Gates of Transylvania, a name given to describe the small pass between mountain ranges, one of the only ways to enter Transylvania with a large army from the south. From here it seems that Durus abdicated his kingship in favour of his nephew, seeing the changing tides and knowing his life had been good. From the scant records we have it seems to have been a peaceful transfer of power. Durus would retire to the mountain fortresses and die peacefully. Through this massacre of a Roman army, Decebalus had solidified himself as king of the Dacians. Word of his act spread quickly, and so had his influence. In the year 88 AD, Rome sent another force under Tetius Julianus who had reclaimed some Roman glory in a battle against Dacian forces, once again at the Iron Gates of Transylvania. Julianus, knowing of the previous Roman defeats, tried to raise morale by ordering his soldiers to paint their name and that of their centurion on their shields, so they might be easily identified for acts of bravery after this coming battle. It seemed to work. The Dacians were led by a general named Vecinus, whose force was eventually beaten by the Romans. Trapped and facing certain death, he threw himself to the floor, and hid amongst the bodies of his dead countrymen until nightfall, then making his escape back into the mountains. Even with this Roman victory, their advantage could not be pressed. Rome's vast empire and ability to pull resources from so many corners of their expansive territories was also a huge burden. The Germanic tribes in the west had been smashing Roman armies, the Marcomanni were in revolt, and to the east the Sarmatians were handing defeats to Roman forces as well. The empire was stretched thin. Domitian would now make his most grave mistake though, Needing forces from Mosia, he asked for peace with Decebalus, so that he might reinforce his other beleaguered regions. Decebalus, though, would make the most of his position. He would agree to peace on his terms. Domitian made large concessions and made some strange decisions that Trajan would have to face the consequences of. Domitian's wars stretched across all of Europe and beyond. His forces were fighting bloody battles on the edge of the known world on the foggy shores of England. In the dark forests of Germania, the Swaby were on the move and on the Pontic steppes hordes of Sarmatian cavalry encroached ever further. A new rising king in Dacia hardly seemed like something Domitian wanted added to his list of large-scale conflicts, so Domitian made his peace, but it cost him. He would have to make a huge annual tribute of up to 8 million sesterces, and he would also recognise Decebalus as a king in his own right. Decebalus' brother would go to Rome to receive an honorary diadem to represent this great recognition from Rome. The Roman emperor would bring Decebalus into the fold, keeping him as a client king to act as a buffer from the peoples migrating north of the Black Sea and the tribes north of modern-day Romania. The Dacians would allow Roman armies to cross through their territories without fear of ambush and massacre. This would help Domitian handle the cross-empire problems he had and his migration of troops. Although a tactical truce in a time of war, Domitian made some other questionable decisions. He gave Decebalus Roman artisans and engineers in return for Roman hostages. These craftsmen would be instrumental in building new fortresses and bolstering Dacian defences and their chain of mountain hideouts from which they ruled. The truce was also not popular with Romans. These upstart Thracian mongrels had killed the commander of the Praetorian Guard and taken the head of a previous consul and governor. They had looted the legion's golden eagles and taken them back into their kingdom to hang high as a sign of their Dacian might, glorifying the deaths of honourable Roman soldiers. No matter how these Romans felt though, during this time of peace, Dacian power would only grow. Decebalus would use this period of calm with the empire to stretch his kingdom even further. Rome would tolerate this growth for the time being, as long as Decebalus did not disrupt the carefully curated chain of client states that stretched across the Roman frontier. Decebalus' kingdom would grow by vast amounts during this period. His capital in the mountains would also become a hideout for Roman deserters and malcontents. For the most part, the peace between Rome and Dacia held well though. In the year 96 AD, Domitian would be assassinated by a court conspiracy, and two years later in 98 AD, Trajan would become emperor. On taking power, Trajan would tour the Danubian frontier, clearly already planning his next step. The Dacian kingdom was still on the rise. They were uniting tribes and suppressing their enemies. They had embarrassed Rome, taking their golden standards and killing two important and respected Romans alongside legions of experienced soldiers. They had then managed to claim a huge annual payment from Rome which was not sustainable, 
and now Trajan would seek to make his first major mark as emperor and show the other kingdoms how he planned to rule. The Dacians were not like the Germanic tribes though. They were a highly organised state that were creating their own chain of alliances, were highly armed and highly armoured, and had a huge pool of warriors from which they could draw to wage war. As is the story with so much of the Roman Empire's conquests though, once the Romans set their attention and resources to a singular task, it was generally achieved. They had a military resource and engineering advantage over almost every civilization of their age. After gaining senatorial approval, Trajan would march into Dacia, launching Trajan's first Dacian War of 101 to 102 AD. Over the previous years in preparation for this war, Mosia had been reinforced massively by the Romans. It had 13 legions in the region and was ready to reclaim the honour that had been lost under Domitian. Trajan at the head of the army would cross into Dacia by the upper Danube, burning towns and villages as they went, forcing the Dacians back into their mountains. He would then meet a Dacian army at the second battle of Tape, this time ending with a Roman victory. But both sides took huge casualties and the Dacians retreated after a fierce storm of thunder and lightning, thought to be an omen from their gods. Although a decisive victory for Rome, Trajan had taken a larger number of casualties than expected. So many Romans were injured that Domitian's own camp linens were cut up to make bandages. He retired to the Roman garrisons to wait for winter and resume his campaigns in the spring. Decebalus, on the other hand, felt winter was a perfectly suited season for war. He would unite with the Sarmatian Roxolani and then the Bastarnae peoples. Together they would attempt to wrongfoot the Romans, crossing the frozen Danube like they had in Decebalus' first major raids into Mosia in 85 AD. The plan was to head south and raid the province, forcing Trajan out of his fortified positions. Decebalus' rise though had seen its zenith. Trajan's time had now come. As the Dacian army made their crossing at the frozen Danube, the ice was still not thick enough to support a huge army. Many of the men fell into the river drowning and freezing to death. The Dacians would then take part in a minor night battle near Necropolis in modern day Bulgaria. But shortly after at the Battle of Adam Clisi, it is estimated a large Sarmatian cavalry force of up to 15,000 men was massacred by a huge Roman army of up to eight legions. It is believed the Romans lost 4,000 men in this battle. Trajan would march on the Dacian capital of Sarmesia Jatusa. It was a capital within the Carpathian Mountains consisting of six fortified mountain villages that had secret pathways and pastures to each other. The chain of defences ensured that if overran the Dacians could proceed to the next point of protection. The centrepiece of this defensive chain was Sarmesia Jatusa Regia, a mountain fortress comprising six citadels atop a 1200 meter high plateau in the Oristine Mountains, the most important social, religious and cultural site of this ancient society. The remains of these fortresses and cultural icons still exist today and the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Decebalus would be surrounded and overrun. He would sue for peace and after these costly battles, he would be forced to give up conquered territories, hand over Roman military and engineering experts who had deserted the Dacian Kingdom, and he would also be forced to give up a large number of weapons, destroy fortifications, and return the war machines given during the First Treaty. Trajan returned to Rome in triumph in the year 102 AD. The peace would hold firm for three years. In that time, though, Decebalus would not obey the rules laid out by Trajan. Decebalus had been embarrassed in the First War, and Trajan had won both battles north and south of the Danube, and brought his great weapons of war to the walls of Decebalus' capital. Dacian nobles had prostrated at Trajan's feet, and Decebalus had lost respect among his people. Both Trajan and Decebalus, having taken such large casualties, both knew this peace was not to last. It was unfinished business. Decebalus had to make a move or he would no doubt be ousted from within, or Trajan would come to finish the job he had started. Decebalus had sent envoys to the Parthians, and he had started to subjugate the Sarmatian Lazigi people again, those people who were allies of Rome and would fight alongside them. Decebalus would refortify and try to reaffirm alliances with enemies of Rome. Trajan knew the only way to secure this dangerous frontier was to conquer it entirely. Trajan could hardly hide the signs of his mounting force in Mosia. Decebalus, panicked by the increased amount of Roman activity, would send Roman deserters back into Mosia to try and determine what was being planned. He also sent a group of deserters with the goal of assassinating Trajan. This plot would be discovered and those involved would confess under torture conducted by Trajan's soldiers. Decebalus would then lure a Trajan legate, Longinus, to a negotiation on the rumour that Decebalus was ready to surrender and agree to all Trajan's terms. Decebalus would instead kidnap Longinus and use him as a hostage, taking him everywhere he went as a guarantee of his security. A freedman would procure and slip some poison to Longinus 
and he would die that night, removing himself from the equation and saving himself the shame or horror of what may have awaited him. Although the prevailing winds of war were moving in one direction, Trajan would take his time in his build-up. He was managing an entire empire after all, and he had also made certain strategic decisions after his first campaign against Decebalus that would make this second phase far more simple. First off, he had constructed the bridge of Apollodorus over the Danube. It was a kilometre in length and was the largest bridge built for a thousand years, just another nod to Rome's engineering might. Lots of the last pieces of evidence, if you want to call them that, about these final stages of the war come from depictions on Trajan's column. The Roman victory column erected in 113 AD to commemorate the Dacian Wars, Decebalus, sure of what was coming his way, would take the first steps of this war, raiding Roman lands, sacking towns and Roman forts, catching fort builders and ambushes and massacring them. Trajan would arrive with his 12 legions and effectively sweep aside any and all defending forces. The Dacian allies were not as willing to protect their alliances at this point. The writing was on the wall. Trajan had arrived for one thing, Decebalus' head. Trajan would winter in the region until spring 106 AD, when the major attacks on the Dacian fortifications would begin. They would be overrun, burned and slaughtered one by one, moving through the mountain passes at a brutal and mechanised speed. Decebalus would attempt to negotiate, but Trajan insisted on Decebalus giving himself up to Trajan personally. Decebalus would instead hand out poison chalices to the Dacian nobles in a mass suicide event, and then attempt to flee to the north to put up one last historic fight against the Roman oppressors. His time had already run out though. Using depictions from Trajan's column and accounts from a horseman himself, it is thought that a cavalry detachment found the fleeing Decebalus and his forces. Rather than suffer the humiliation of being paraded through Rome in a triumph, he put his curved blade to his throat and continued on his journey to the next stage of life, emptying his blood back into the lands from which he was born. Decebalus and the Dacians inflicted on Rome some embarrassing defeats that I'm sure they wished they could have forgotten, but now one of Rome's greatest threats of this period had been dispatched. To make this clear to the Roman public, Trajan would take Decebalus' head as promised and send it back to Rome, displaying us in the Germanian steps. He would have Trajan's column erected as an eternal emblem of his might. Dacia would be effectively destroyed, its population having been ravaged through two decades of raiding and wars, plus Trajan's slaughter of the population after this final assault. It is thought over 100,000 Dacians were enslaved and sent back to Rome, a huge boost to the economy. The Dacian gold mines were estimated to produce over 200 million denarii per annum to Rome. Dacian salt mines would also become a huge part of the Roman economy, salt being one of the most important minerals in the world at the time. It is estimated, even today, that salt mines in Romania produce up to 550 million tonnes of salt a year. After a betrayal by a Dacian noble, Trajan would uncover Decebalus' gold. He'd used slaves to redirect a river, burying his vast hordes of Dacian gold deep in the riverbed, then returning the river to its original course and slaughtering the slaves who had done the labour. The Dacian gold would help secure Rome's economy for the coming decades. Trajan would put on over 100 days of games, filled with Dacian gladiators and slaves fighting to their death for their new overlord's pleasure. Although it seems Trajan did not find all the gold, the area is still a hotspot for those seeking out treasures today, and in the 1500s, 340 tons of gold was discovered buried in the riverbed, most likely another Dacian trove. Dacia as a region would be divided in two, between north and south. The southern part would become the Roman province of Dacia, while the north would be left independent. The Dacian population had been decimated, and judging by archaeological evidence and the names found in the region after this conquest, Dacian society had been almost totally annihilated. Some Dacians would remain and flee to the north, remaining there for centuries, but the Dacian kingdom was no more, and the last king of Dacia would fall into the embers of the past. Now in our modern age though, we have been given a new reminder of this chapter of our history. In 1994, a Romanian, Yusuf Constantine Dragan, started the project to immortalise Decebalus. Dragan was a gas billionaire and had the statue made over a period of 10 years. The workers would labour for 8 months out of the year working every single day, then take 4 months off for the season continuing this process for a full 10 years until its completion. And so it is that even now, we have this lasting piece of history etched into the very landscape from which Decebalus spent his life protecting. If you were to be floating down the Danube River with depths of 90 metres below you, Dacian warriors stare up from the murky depths of their submerged Danubian graves, and Decebalus looks over you from the heavens. As much a part of the land as the mountain in which he rests, the Dacian footprint is etched into every part of this landscape, 
and their legacy shall last long after we have all left these lands. We are just another set of guests of the once great and proud Dacian kingdom. 